introduce today uh, Ross Kagan, who I met a couple of years ago, actually around that time. He invited me to an amazing conference uh, in England, which uh, was actually a, a non-conference because there were no talks. It was basically just 40 people around the table discussing how to solve cancer. So it was an original approach to, to research uh, and to discussion between scientists. So it's great to have him here in uh, the Dream Conference that we think is uh, something similar to that, where we try to do science uh, uh, a little bit uh, a different way. Um, so Ross is professor at uh, uh, the Mount Sinai uh, in the Department of Developmental and Regenerative Biology. He's director for the Center of Personal Cancer Therapeutics. Um, he's uh, also a senior editor for the Disease Models and, and Mechanism uh, magazine, which uh, we actually published uh, a review on that, a very nice meeting. Uh, I actually did my PhD on fly genetics, so I was very surprised when I first heard about uh, fly avatars. Uh, and how uh, trying to personalize uh, human mutations into flies. Actually, the lab I did my PhD on cloned P53 uh, in flies uh, ended up, you know, more being a circadian uh, clock uh, lab and, you know, got the Nobel Prize last year. So, you know, not, not bad for that. But uh, fly avatars are uh, a really interesting idea. And uh, I really, I think that what pushed Ross to organize that meeting and also to go into uh, creating these avatars is really trying to find solutions for cancer and really trying to find uh, new approaches to, to push uh, forward research. And uh, the idea that also led to the next uh, dream challenge is related to that is, is how can we uh, find new chemicals to, that can really you know, push the, the, the research into the clinic. And that's really what kind of put him, uh, put, put him out of, of his boundaries. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Ross Kagan today to give us the keynote and uh, expecting a, a very exciting talk. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. So uh, th thank you, Pablo. It's really a pleasure to be here. I feel like I'm a game show host with this, I should say. And I know everybody here wanted to be part of SantaCon. So I'll try to make this brief and direct. And for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, welcome to New York. So I am, uh, in fact, a fly guy. And what I'm going to talk about today is my lab has really stepped into this question of not the biology of cancer, but the biology of therapeutics. Why is it that some that uh, a few uh, drugs actually make it through clinical trials, but most don't? What can we learn from the successes? What can we learn from the failures? And I'll argue that we, in some ways, need to take a different approach. And I will. All of this will lead to uh, my finish, which is to talk about how we got to the dream challenge. And then I'm going to hand the baton off to Avner who's actually going to talk about the Dream Challenge, and then we have one of the winners here today, which will be fantastic. So let me get on with it. And this is an outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about uh, cancer models, and everything I'm going to talk about is going to start with fruit flies. Then I'm going to talk about a fly-to-bedside clinical trial and what we've learned from that. And I'm going to finish by talking about drug development, where we use flies and chemistry and computational chemistry to make lead compounds and what we've learned from that and why we put out the dream challenge in sort of a peak of frustration. So that's a lot and I need to get on and I should disclose that some of the compounds I'm going to mention uh, are form the basis of a company that Arvind Dara and I have found founded and so if I ask you to invest in those you should just ignore all of that. Okay, so let's talk about cancer. Um, if you're a multicellular organism, and I'm pretty sure the majority here are, <laughs> um, you're based, you are at risk of getting cancer. So we take a single cell, we divide it into billions of cells, and sometimes those controls go badly. And uh, some of you may be aware of, there's a very famous 
a papyrus, the Edwin Smith papyrus, that's devoted to discussing medical problems that they had in ancient Egypt 3,500 years ago. And in one, actually in a couple of different sections, they talk about uh, eight women who clearly have breast cancer. They talk about how they treated it, which was by cauterization, which in the days where there's no anesthesia, that's no joke. But most importantly, they talk about the frustration of it, and that frustration has continued. So we have many ways of treating cancer. Uh, still, the most successful, uh, the one that works the best is surgery, but we have many other approaches now, immunotherapy, drug therapy, which I'm going to focus on. Um, and we have been at this for some time now, so how are we doing? In the ca case of drug therapy, let's see. In the case of drug therapy, uh, uh, last year, 2017, 6% of drugs that went into clinical trials were successful, 6%. And just to be, put that uh, number in perspective, if I took 100 kinase inhibitors at random and just stuck them into clinical trials, I'm pretty confident we would get six of them approved, at least. Okay, Because the bar, in many cases, is quite low. For example, I'm going to talk about colorectal cancer. That's the number two cancer killer of Americans. 3% uh, of drugs that have gone overall for colorectal cancer have been approved. And the major uh, uh, standards of care, such as regorafenib, improve lifespan a little under five weeks. Okay? And actually, more recent studies have challenged even that extension. And I should point out that these drugs are very toxic. So it's not like there's no trade-off here. And of course, they're super expensive. Regorafenib is about 12000 a month. So what's the problem here? And I'm not going to solve that problem in my talk today, but I'm going to talk about some of the things we've learned and how this has led to the dream challenge. So remember Drosophila? You're in high school. You had to cross red eyes to white eyes. Remember all that? So things have changed. Okay. Put simply, with fruit flies, uh, you, we can turn any gene or set of genes on or off in any cell, forget tissue, any cell at any stage, any time that we wish. So the, the genetic tools in Drosophila are extremely powerful. And things that I care about for cancer, most of the major, not all, but most of the major tissues uh, that we have, they have. They have heart, they have kidney, uh, lungs, and so on and so forth. So that's important. And um, as I mentioned, powerful tools. But most importantly, what I'm going to talk about today, some of the compounds I'm going to talk about, these the compounds that we identify by doing whole animal screening are different, not better or worse, they're just different than the compounds you would find from cell-based or organoid screening. So the compounds we identify, they're active against the tumor, but that activity is both directly in the tumor, but also in other places in the body, like the muscle, the liver, and so on, that feedback to help choke that tumor out. So it's a very different class, and that's a class that we've been exploring quite a bit. There are plenty of disadvantages in Drosophila. I could spend the whole talk just discussing the disadvantages. The major disadvantage is that the details in Drosophila are different than humans, and details matter quite a bit in terms of therapeutics. So everything we do in flies, we use that as a lead to, to bring us into new uh, intellectual space, and then we explore that further in mammalian models, so, such as they are. Okay? All right. So I need to sort of jump forward here. And I want to start by talking about colorectal cancer, as I promised. Uh, Erdem Bangi, a uh, postdoc in my lab, who recently left and just started his own laboratory down in Florida. So go Erdem. And Erdem was interested in colorectal cancer, and in particular, this question of why is it that drugs that work so well in our mouse models, in KRAS models, and APC models, why have they consistently failed in humans? And so to, tr to explore this, one of the things that Aram did is he started to build more complex models, more genetically complex models. So he went into the TCGA database. He looked at several hundred colorectal cancer patients. And he looked at what are the combinations of mutations that you tend to see together. Not the most common, common uh, genetic mutations overall, but what combinations do you see together. So for example, the most common quadruple combination is KRAS, APC, P53, P10. Erdem built that fly. Um, he also built, for that fly, all, um, transgenic flies that have all the possible triple combinations, double combinations, single combinations that make up that quadruple. So 15 fly lines 
for each quadruple that he built. He did that for four different quadruple combinations. He also did a quintuple combination. Problem is when you get up to five, the statistics really fall off and the number of patients are, are very few. So what did Erdem learn by building these fly models? First of all, let me show you what a fly colorectal cancer model looks like. Here is an image of a part of the fly hindgut where these uh, transgenes were targeted to. The hindgut is similar to our rectum, and this has been labeled with GFP, so green is transformed. This is a four-hit model. And what you see here is the hindgut. You see the muscle wall around the hindgut. I hope you can see this is what's called trachea. It carries oxygen, kind of like our arterioles. And what you can see here is that a cell has actually extended a process through the muscle wall. When it uh, comes in contact with a source of oxygen, it corkscrews around it. The cell body walks out of the muscle, through the muscle wall, out of the gut, hops under the trachea, takes off to distant sites around the fly. This is an adult fly. And if you come back a week later, the fly has thousands of cells migrating through its body that originated from the gut. And if you come back a week after that, the uh, fly has secondary tumors where these cells have intercalated into distant sites, formed secondary tumors, remodeled new trachea into them, similar to neotrachea, neoangiogenesis in our tumors. And around two to three weeks, the fly dies of metastatic disease. You with it? Yes? I'll take that as a yes. I'll take that as a post-lunch yes. So, so we've done quite a bit of validation of this, this activates markers that you see in these tumors and so on. So it's not a perfect model, but it turns out it's a useful one. So we've learned quite a bit about it. Uh, this is published, so I'm not going to go through this in any detail. Mercifully, we have aspects of overproliferation, multilayering, so polyp formation and migration, first steps in um, metastasis-like behavior. And of course, Remember, Erdem made all these subcombinations, and looking at all those and looking at all these phenotypes, he was able to show something that's not too surprising, which is that there's a lot of emergent properties when you start to put these mutations together. So I don't think anybody here would be shocked to hear that. For example, P53 in flies, just like us, acts as guardian of the genome. When the genome is damaged, it becomes activated um, and acts as a checkpoint. But when you put it in the context of these three other mutations, in fact, P53 acts with RAS um, and with P10 to regulate migration. And we don't know, understand the mechanism behind that. Okay? So more importantly, remember the question that Erdem set out to, to, to solve or to address is why are drugs failing? So he asked the question, what's the difference between a one-hit fly and a four-hit fly? Right. So in a one-hit fly, and I won't show you uh, the data, but in a one-hit mouse, we work with uh, Owen Sansom, we tested 16 drugs, most of which had failed in clinical trials. We tested them against the flies and the mice, and in both cases, 13 of the 16 worked beautifully to knock the tumors out, just as was published, which is good. But when he moved to a four-hit fly or a three-hit mouse, zero of those 16 actually worked on that model, okay? In other words, genetic complexity leads to resistance. And we think that that's a general property. It's not the only form of resistance, but we think it's a key one and probably explains a lot of why our models have just not been predictive. They're not complex enough. We're always trying to boil things down and simplify them, but tumors don't really care about that. And in fact, what he found with further research because remember, he has all the subcombinations. He could map out what combinations caused resistance to each of these drugs, and it's a very complicated thing that no mere mortal could figure out. What he really found was, if you want to treat a four-hit model, you need a drug cocktail. In this case, a, a, a PI3 kinase pathway inhibitor and a proteasome inhibitor. And this actually works in a very surprising method and really sort of points to the power of just, um, just phenotypic screening. Right, without understanding the mechanism. So what we learned from this is that genetic complexity matters. But what I haven't told you, because I don't know the answer to it, is how much genetic complexity do you have to capture to successfully treat a patient? Right, That's the goal here. The goal is not to understand cancer. The goal is to treat it successfully. So 
that's where we got, and I should say here is the mouse data with that two drug combination and it works beautifully in mice as well as uh, flies and we're actually pushing into the clinics with this two drug combination. But that takes me to what um, um, Pablo was talking about, which is it, we actually opened up uh, a few years ago now a fly to bedside clinical trial um, in a, a center that we developed, the Center for Personalized Cancer Therapeutics. And really the scientific purpose of opening this trial was to ask that question. How much complexity do you have to capture to be able to successfully predict treatment of a patient? So I just want to be clear that this is very much a, um, a, a joint effort. So the fly guy didn't know a ton about how to run a clinical trial. And uh, we've had a weekly meeting every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. for probably the last four years now. And uh, Chris Basikowitz, Lena Ang, Marshall Posner, Eric Schott, and so on, we've all gotten together to build this trial. And I want to give a special shout out to Erdem, who actually ran this trial until recently, and uh, a host of technicians, of which some are shown here. And the way we're running this trial is summarized here. And that is, um, a patient comes into the clinics, Mount Sinai or elsewhere, uh, in the US, we have focused primarily on colorectal and thyroid cancers. Okay? A patient comes in, if they're diagnosed, we offer them uh, the option of enrolling on the trial. There's no disadvantage, we don't charge the patients anything, we don't allow them to have surgery for us, it has to be for other reasons. Um, should, if they consent, we take a sample, a biopsy, or a, a tissue from debulking surgery, and we do a pretty extensive genomic analysis whole exome sequencing, we uh, uh, analyze copy number variation, we have 16 antibodies, pathway-specific antibodies that we stain on their tissue, phospho erc and so on. And based on all of that, we build a, a fly, a personalized fly avatar for each patient. And we've pushed the fly technology to the point where we'll build up to an 18-hit model. So in other words, we don't just put in the cancer genes, things that drive cancer, we also put in the so-called passengers. Everything goes in. Because what we found, and this is a longer talk, what we found was when you add the passengers, they don't make the tumors more aggressive, but they change drug response. And of course, that's the only thing that matters. Okay? So we build personalized fly avatar for each patient. Each one gets their own avatar. We then grow up 400,000 of them, and I don't really have time to go into the details, we grow up 400,000 of them, and I have a room filled with robotics, and we do robotics-based drug screening of the flies. So we have these uh, deep 96-well plates. Food goes into each well. Different drug goes into each well. I'll tell you uh, the library in a moment. Uh, Ten flies go into each well. We put an oxygen permeable lid on top. The flies hatch out. They eat the food. They eat the drug. And then we run a phase three clinical trial right there in the dish. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so what are we screening? We can't screen novel compounds and give them to patients, of course. So the way we create novel compounds that the FDA is allowing us is that we have a library of 1,500 FDA-approved drugs. About 80 of those are cancer drugs. The rest are anti-inflammatories and antidepressants and so on and so forth. We screen through that through multiple rounds to typically create a two- to three-drug cocktail, unique cocktail for each patient. So in each case that we've treated a patient, they've taken cocktails that, to our knowledge, have not been um, seen a patient before. Um, yes, and then once we have those hits, we go through a lot of vetting with tumor board meetings and, and internal review boards and so on. If everything checks out, we come back to the patient, we offer them the drug combination if they need it, and uh, if they're relapsing, and then we treat the patient. So I just want to show you a couple of examples Here's actually just an example of fly screening data. This is all going to be de-identified patients. Here's a patient, uh, as I recall, this was a 12-hit model. This patient responded a bit to trametinib, but as we went deeper in screening and more combinations, we found that in this case a triple combination worked best for this patient's avatar, and this patient's actually being treated with this right now. Um, incidentally, this is a heart drug, and this is a, um, a virus, an antiviral drug. And this is a cancer drug, okay? So here's an example of a patient that responded. This is a colorectal cancer patient, a 63-year-old um, uh, male. Uh, um, he had uh, failed 
multiple standard treatments as we require. We built a nine hit personalized avatar for this patient. It was KRAS positive. Currently, once you failed um, uh, uh, therapy in your KRAS positive colorectal cancer, your subsequent response rate is 1%. So you're in trouble. Um, so we made a nine hit model. And after screening this patient's avatar, we came up with a, kina a MEK kinase inhibitor plus a bisphosphonate which we're currently looking into. Why in the world does this uh, make things better? And you can see here, this patient had a tumor that was actually, this is uh, part of the metastasis, is growing, this is, a, this is um, uh, up high, this is growing along the spinal cord here, so this patient was in serious trouble. And 27 weeks uh, later, after being treated with this, the, most of the tumors had uh, dramatically um, shrunken, and this patient, who was not expected to live out the month, actually lived for over two years, and I'm sad to say um, passed recently. Okay, But I don't want to give the impression that it always works. It doesn't. Okay, We've had plenty of failures as well. So here's a patient, and I just want to discuss one. I think it's important to point out that not, not just the, the successes. We built a 13-hit model for this patient, also colorectal cancer. It was an unusual, and that it was a MEK kinase was the major driver. You don't see MEK mutations very often. It's a failed standard of care. Um, and this is the only patient that we treated with a single drug, trametinib, which is a MEK inhibitor. That would make sense. So this is classic targeted therapy. We treated this patient, scanned them at eight weeks, and the primary lesions, in fact, responded as the flies would predict. But secondary tumors had emerged immediately, and we had to take the patient off the treatment because resistance emerged immediately. And I have to say, I think about this patient a lot. We're not going to treat patients with single agents anymore. I think this is what's been happening with targeted therapies in general, okay? which currently have about a 6% success rate. Right? So I, I talk more about um, you know, how this is going and so on at the question session, but I need to move on. So what I've told you so far in my talk is that we've begun to use flies to really build complex models. And as the flies get more and more complex, resistance to drugs really emerges in ways that we've not, you can't just eyeball it and predict out. It's really complicated ways. So it's really a computational problem and we really welcome taking this problem on as we, especially as we gather more uh, clinical data. And I talked about the Center for Personalized Cancer Therapeutics where we built a fly to bedside clinical trial which is ongoing and we focus on drug combinations and we've had some success with patients that have been um, completely resistant. We've also had some failures, and of course, we're trying to understand why we succeed sometimes and sometimes we don't. Okay? Is everybody with me? All right, because I'm going to change topics. Okay, so that's, so what we learned from this was, again, complexity matters. It matters in our models, and complexity matters in the drugs. Remember, to really get at these cancers, we require drug cocktails. There are many disadvantages to drug cocktails. Um, putting, getting two companies to work together for a clinical trial is a challenge at best. Even the manufacturing of two different drugs to put them in trials is challenging because you have, the tolerance has to be much uh, better in, in order to put two co cocktails together because they have unusual interactions with each other. There are many challenges, and so drug cocktails are the exception uh, in trials. Um, so what um, Arvind Dar, Arvind Schlesinger, and myself did is we uh, launched many years ago now an effort to create single drugs that mimic the activity of cocktails. That is polypharmacology, network-based drugs, multi whatever the uh, granting agencies prefer, multi-targeting, that's what we call them. And to introduce you how we got into this problem, this really is a throwback now, I need to tell you just a moment, a little bit about RET-dependent tumors especially uh, thyroid tumors that are RET-dependent. So uh, RET has been recognized in an increasing number of tumor types. Lung, a small, about 2 to 4% of lung cancers have RET fusions. Um, colorectal cancer, about a 1% to 2% of colorectal and so on. But the majority of medullary thyroid carcinomas have activating mutations in RET. Okay, So RET is a problem. And um, here is a high-resolution crystallographic structure of RET. It is a transmembrane receptor. Okay, It binds uh, members of the GDNF family. It has a co-receptor. And upon binding, it dimerizes, transphosphorylates. That flips the activation loop open. And the kinase cleft is open for business. 
Okay. Um, patients who have medullary thyroid carcinoma, and I should say it's one of the few thyroid cancers that actually can be lethal, so it's, it's, not, it's really a problem, have typically mutations class 2A in the extracellular domain that cause spontaneous dimerization, or class 2B in the activation loop that open the kinase up, and these are constitutively active as monomers. Okay? So these are activating mutations that cause this very deadly thyroid cancer. So what does a thyroid cancer look like in a fruit fly? So I'll just tell you flat out, despite my uh, beginning and the advantages of flies, they don't have a thyroid. Okay? They have a very skinny neck. We may have missed it, but I don't think so. They don't make thyroxin or any of the things that thyroid does, so they don't have that. So instead, we expressed RET in the early days in the fly eye for reasons which I can't defend anymore, but it doesn't matter. It turned out to be useful. So here is a control eye. It's really one of nature's beautiful structures. It's made of uh, hundreds of these little unit eyes called omatidia that are beautifully arrayed. And if you express either human or fly, oncogenic, in this case 2B, forms of RET in the eye, you get this. I hope you can see here that you have tumors growing out of this eye. Um, uh, you actually, uh, if you pop the top and look underneath, you'll see overproliferation. You'll see um, uh, uh, um, aberrations in cell types as cells dedifferentiate. And the major reason this cell, this eye is smaller, is because cells have many cells have left the eye capsule and have migrated away. The first steps in metastasis. Okay. So again, I can't defend this model except to say it turned out to be very useful. So this was many years ago now. And we did use this to do really my lab's first drug screens. And we identified a compound that now has a name, vandetinib. And I'm really going to give this short shrift uh, and not going to give proper credit to everybody. But basically, we fed this fly many compounds and working with AstraZeneca, fed them a compound called ZD6474. And I hope you can see that just feeding them this drug compared to uh, flies, uh, control flies, when they eat this drug, it brings the eye all the way back almost completely to normal. And based on this data and data from um, Massimo Santoro's lab, cell line data, this went into clinical trials. In fact, AstraZeneca was on our original paper, along with the clinician Sam Wells, who ran the original trials. This went into trials and was actually approved in 2011 as the first and still a standard of care for medullary thyroid carcinoma. Okay? So this was really the first example of a fly to to bedside uh, example of a drug that's actually made it through. And it convinced me that flies could be useful, and I basically moved the lab to start studying disease. Okay. So you can ask the question, okay, this is an easy problem. This is a one-hit tumor, one of the few one-hit solid tumors. What does vandetinib do? Is it a RET inhibitor, right? If I'm a company, I just make a RET inhibitor problem solved. RET inhibitors are problematic. Um, they can cause uh, uh, problems uh, because adults require RET for proper homeostasis. And in fact, vandetinib, it turns out it does hit RET, but it's an extremely dirty kinase. And our data and data from AstraZeneca indicate that actually those off-targets turn out to be important for why it succeeded, where other cleaner drugs didn't. Okay? So this is where we really began to think about the concept of polypharmacology, or network-based drugs. And now we're getting closer and closer to the dream challenge. And I just want to tell you some work that was done by Avner and his postdoc Peter Ung, Arvind Dar and his postdoc Alex Skopton, and a now a former postdoc of mine who also just recently started his lab at University of Hokkaido, Mas Masa Sonishita, really a brilliant, brilliant uh, 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 postdoc. And he took on this problem of how to build individual compounds that were polypharm, but in a rational way. And we've done multiple examples of this, which we've published. I want to show you the most recent one that came out this year. And what Masa did is he took a RET fly, in this case not expressing RET in the eye, but in several places in the fly so that it would drop dead of um, metastatic disease. And he screened all the FDA-approved drugs from that time. Uh, 32 or 31 kinase inhibitors. And he found that of those kinase inhibitors, vandetinib worked fair in this assay, but the one that worked the best was serafinib. Okay? And we had hit serafinib early on, but it, it was pretty toxic to the flies. And I want to point out that while it's the best, 
it's only rescuing about 5% of the flies to viability. Okay? So not a great drug. And we set out to improve this in a rational way. So serafinib, much like vandetinib, is a polypharm drug. Here is a kinase wheel. This is a tree of the human kinases. And the red circles here are the different kinases that serafinib hits. It was originally built as a RAF inhibitor, hence the name serafinib. Uh, RAF is somewhere over here. But you can see that it actually uh, hits dozens of uh, targets. It's a very, very dirty drug. Um, the, the, the good news about it is it's also crazy expensive. It's $17,000 a month, and it makes the patients really sick. It's really a tough drug, which I guess is why it was approved. So here's the structure of serafinib. And what we did, and when I say we, not the fly guy, the chemist and the computational chemist, divided this conceptually into four uh, pieces. We checked each of these domains, and what we found was focusing on the cap domain, the part that attacks the so-called DFG pocket, turned out to be the most useful for changing the targets of this, as you'll see. So remember, we gave serafinib to flies, and we went from 0% viability to 5%. So then what Masa did is a old genetics trick in uh, the fly world called a dominant genetic modifier screen, where he fed the fly serafinib, and then one by one by one, he removed one copy of each kinase in the fly kinum. Flies have 252 kinases. He checked all of them against serafinib. Okay? And he got two sets of hits. In some cases, removing a copy of, for example, ERK in the presence of serafinib, instead of 5% of them living, in the case of ERK, 60% of the flies lived. And what that tells you is if serafinib would hit RAS signaling, for example, ERK, harder or better, it would be a better drug. Does that make sense? We call that a pro-target. On the other hand, other kinases, such as MINK1, as I'm going to show you, or MINK, uh, when we removed a copy of it, instead of 5% of the flies living, they all died. And we knew from in vitro studies that serafinib directly hit MINK1, so we would call MINK1 an anti-target, and serafinib would be a better drug if we would get that activity out of there. Can you see how we're mapping out the liabilities and the potential of serafinib in a very systematic way? So here is a simple map of the pro and anti targets for serafinib. Okay, in red, the anti targets, in uh, blue, the pro targets, and unsurprisingly, red is a pro target. Make one, as I mentioned, is an anti target. So, this is where the modeling came in. We have serafinib, we have a roadmap. How do we go from one to the other? And so, for example, um, I'm just going to focus on a simple examples of RET, a key pro target, and MINK1, a key anti target. Both were already hit by serafinib. Both need to change the, in their activities for serafinib. So Peter, um, Abner's postdoc, um, doing modeling, estimated that the DFG binding pocket, where the cap domain binds to, was about 163 angstroms in RET, but was a bit smaller in MINK1. And what that suggested was that if we just elaborate the structure here, we could potentially find a, a combination or an extension of the structure that would fit into RET, but not fit into the pocket of MINK1, the anti-target. You with me? So you see how we're sort of trying to reason this out. So um, with some empirical uh, uh, trying, this actually worked. And here's a summary of um, what we did, not showing the drugs that just showed no activity of all, at all. Here is the cap domain of serafinib, 5% of the flies lived. Okay, here's regorafenib, its sister compound, about 3% lived. We identified the prone anti-targets for serafinib, and using those uh, modeling and trial and error, we got to LS115, where about 25% of them lived. We then took LS115, ran through the kinome, found prone anti-targets for LS115, and got all the way up to about 85% efficacy now with APS645 by really elaborating this. And I should say that since we published this, is now the 17th best uh, lead that we have. We have hits that are uh, 16 hits. They're actually even better than this that go towards 100% rescue. So if you're a fruit fly and you have red dependent cancer, we have you covered. <laughs> Good news. Um, and here is an example. If we feed flies 
uh, this drug. Um, here is control. You can see tumors emerging out of the uh, anterior part of the eye. This is uh, normal here. Serafinib, if anything, actually makes it a little worse for reasons I can discuss. But in any case, APS645, you're good to go. And the good news is that's not just true in flies. Here is some mouse xenograft data. So we grew thyroid, medullary thyroid carcinoma cells, TT cells in the mouse. We grew it up to 100 millimeters and then began drug treatment. And compared to the parent compound, serafinib, or one of the current standards of care, cabozantinib, APS645 looks terrific. In fact, if I showed you the waterfall plot, you would see that many of the mice show no tumor at all. Okay? And importantly, um, in terms of toxicity, if we look at body weights of the mice, that, that APS645, despite excellent um, efficacy, shows little or no um, uh, toxicity compared to vehicle. And like I said, this is now one of a, actually 20 drugs, or 20 hits that we're looking more closely at. Okay, so that's the basic approach that we use. I just want to say one more shout out to in vitro, in vivo versus in vitro studies, and then I'm going to wrap this up. So here is the structure of APS645. And um, to my surprise, when Arvin built analogs of this, that instead of having fluorines here, he switched those for hydrogens. Um, and then we, th we sent these to DiscoverX to look at their in vitro kinase binding. These were almost identical in their binding. They had very, very similar profiles. But when we try them in flies and more recently in cell lines, here's some fly data. So here's fly viability. APS645, as I showed you before, about 85 to 90% rescue. You swap these for hydrogens. They look great uh, in vitro, but they do nothing in the animal or in the cells. We're still exploring why that is, but the point I want to bring up is this is the more typical structure. If you had uh, tested this out on a cell line, this would have come up negative and you would have just abandoned the entire space. But it turns out this space is actually a terrific space. You just have to do whole animal screening to realize its potential. Okay, so to summarize this part of the talk, um, we are developing a platform where we build uh, models that we validate in flies, cancer, and as I'll mention, other diseases as well. We use them to do an initial screen. Once we have an initial hit, we pull out the fly genetics. If it's kinases, for example, we screen the fly kinome to identify prone anti-targets. And then we find the smartest computational medicinal chemist that we can to build analogs here. And I should connect this arrow back to here. So this is about a two-week cycle. It takes us two weeks to check uh, new drugs in flies, and it takes them two weeks to make a new set. And so over time, we can rapidly run and sort of follow the branches of what works the best until we optimize it. Okay? And we've been doing this for an increasing number of diseases. We have lead hits in colorectal cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, and so on. So I'm very excited about this. I do want to mention that my lab has started to push these platforms into other diseases, and I'm showing this because it's relevant to what Abner is going to talk about. So in addition to RET-dependent tumors, we've, we're also um, looking at, uh, for example, neurodegenerative diseases, tauopathies, and that's part of our challenge, dream challenge. And I just want to show you, similar to the pro and anti-targets, here's what happens if you express tau in the fly eye. This is human tau that causes neurodegeneration in humans. Uh, it's an inherited disease. If you express it in the fly eye, which has neurons in it, you can see degeneration of those neurons. And then if you walk through the kinome, you find, for example, removing a, a copy of Aurora kinase A actually makes the eye better. This would be a pro-target. You would want to actually hit this target to, make, uh, to suppress the effects of tau. And this would be an anti-target, although a subtle one, PAC1, where actually the eye gets a bit worse. But the rate-limiting step, and this is I'm going to finish up, the rate-limiting step of this platform is here. So the predictions with computational chemistry, in a perfect world, we would map out with genetics, here's your pro-targets, here's your anti-targets, you plug that into a computer, it spits out a structure, you try that, and you cure cancer. This is the dream. Okay? But this, as I guess everybody here knows better than I do, has really been a challenge. And so because it's been a challenge and because that's such a critical part of the platform, this is how we were inspired to open this dream challenge working with Sage Bio Networks. 
can we come up with a way to make better network or polypharm based drugs that hit multiple targets, pro targets, and leave anti targets alone? That's the key. And can we do it in a rational, predictive way? Okay, so that's my talk. Um, to summarize, I began by talking about fly models. And as we made these models more and more complex, and I didn't really show you the mouse data, but it's true in the mice as well, as we upped the complexity, drug resistance began to emerge in ways that are very complex. Based on that, we opened a clinical trial, Fly to Bedside, Center for Personalized Cancer Therapeutics, where we fell on drug combinations, where we've begun to treat patients. We have some early successes as well as some um, failures in getting patients that have been recalcitrant to current standards of care, and we're starting to learn more and more about what's required to predict drugs in a patient, drug response in a patient. And finally, I talked about riffing off of this to now try to create single entities that capture the magic of these drug combinations through rational polypharmacology. The rate-limiting step here is the computational part, which has really been difficult, and it's been um, fantastic to have Avner taking this challenge on, but we opened this up to the community, this dream challenge. And with that, I'll end. I'd like to thank the, those who have done the work both in the lab and our collaborators and our funding. This has been quite a ride for a fly geneticist and a great learning experience for me. Thank you very much. I think, I think we have time for maybe one question or two if you have for, yeah. Um, uh, sure. Yeah. Where the fly avatar, uh, you put the opportunity.